So maybe I can just um, recommend that you find a comfortable posture for yourself. Um, so you've paid a lot of attention maybe to parking your car. So I'd like you to give some of that care and attention to parking our bodies. And for me, certainly the purpose of meditation is knowing my heart. So it's not about torturing my body, putting it in an uncomfortable position that I can't sustain for some period of time without distressing myself. So as an act of care, as an act of loving kindness towards myself, as an act of compassion, I try to find a comfortable position for my body. And it's a way of also just bringing and grounding my attention uh, within the body, bringing it out of the future, dragging it out of the past and into the present moment, into this present moment experience. And uh, the body is a beautiful place to occupy, to make a home of. So I like to begin by just inquiring very kindly, what's happening for me right now? What's happening in my body? Just checking in. What would be kind? What would be caring? What would be nice for this body of mine? And just opening this inquiry, this investigation into my own needs, listening, deep listening to the condition of my body and making any suitable adjustments as an act of kindness, as an act of compassion towards myself, towards this body, that I'm respecting my own needs. Since I'm an expert in my own needs, in my own body, in what's happening inside of me, it's my care of duty to inquire every now and again and check in with myself. Is, is this okay? Is this comfortable for me? And if it isn't, make the suitable adjustments. But do this in a, a slow, careful, considerate kind of way for myself. If I need to move or adjust, move in and, and adjust, not in a way of like shoving myself around, <clears throat> but in a respectful way towards myself, more with the inquiry, does that help? Is this a better position for me? Is this meeting my needs? Rather than being presumptuous about what it is that I need myself, shoving my leg here or there, or putting my hand there just as if it was a nuisance. Instead, very carefully putting it into a place, into a position, just asking, is that it? Is that how, is that how I feel today? Is this, is this suitable? Speaking very kindly to myself, making this body and mind of mine the object of my practice. Starting with this body, kaya, this body, kaya. Reflecting on its needs, kaya nu sati. Making it a base of my interest, of my attention. And breathing into my needs, breathing into it. Even as a mother, protects with her life, her child, her only child, breathing into this body and mind of mine and giving myself permission to be here now in this present moment. So my mobile phone is disconnected because I'm giving priority to myself and to my own needs. And just taking whatever breath I need and letting go, 
letting go of any tension that I may be carrying. Sometimes I like to imagine that I'm carrying my shopping, you know, from the shopping. And I just let down those bags, releasing any tension from my shoulders, neck. And also I can just take a full breath and let it all out, giving myself full permission to enjoy this present moment, to be in this kind way with myself. I own this. This is my responsibility. This is something that I can do anytime I like for myself, taking good care, taking positive or active steps towards my own self-care here. What's happening for me in my head, the top of my head? What's happening for me right now in the back of my head? Is there anything I can do? If not, do nothing. And to the right side of my head, just giving that attention and awareness to the right side of my head. What's happening for me right now? Are you okay, right side of my head? Is there anything needed? And to the left side of my head, just checking. just inquiring. What are the needs of the left side of my head? And my forehead, even as a mother would kiss her child's forehead, so too do I give kind care and attention to my forehead. And my eyes, what do my eyes need right now? What would be kind, what would be caring for my eyes? And let me give me, give myself that care, that attention, that love. And my nose, and my mouth. And my neck. What do I need right now in my neck? Just inquiring, just checking. My shoulders, just checking. And if I find any tension, consciously letting go of those shopping bags, giving myself full permission to release the shopping bags from my shoulders. And my arms, Standing down my arms that are guarding me, protecting me. Giving them permission to be at ease. My hands. My hands like diligent servants and so wonderfully looking after me all the time. Now I ask, what do you need, my hands, my fingers, palms? What can I do for you? And my chest, my lungs, if there's any tension in my lungs, just just taking that breath, taking that time 
to exhale, breathe in deep and exhale. How about if I'm also relaxed and breathing soft, gentle, letting it go, not asking anything more other than just inquiring, is this okay? And uh, my heart, just being with that space in my chest, my heart, just checking. Stomach and intestines, just checking. What do I need right now in my stomach and intestines? How do I feel in my stomach and intestines? Just acknowledging and my back and spine and radiating ribs, just checking. What would be wholesome and good for my spine, back, radiating ribs right now? Just inquiring, not proud or demanding, just inquiring with love and kindness and care even as a mother would protect with her life, her child, her only child, so too do I, with a boundless heart, give this care and attention to my back and spine and radiating ribs. With that intelligent inquiry into my nature, into my needs, giving myself permission permission to be kind to these different parts of my body. And my hips and pelvis, what do I need right now? What do you need? What do these hips and pelvis need right now? What would be kind? And my thigh, my thighs, lifting, walking, moving around, my thighs, so important. What do, what do my thighs need right now? What do the thighs need? And the knees, bending and flexing of great service to me, what do they need right now? Just inquiring, just checking. And my shin and calf, what do they need right now? Just checking. With kindness, with kind regard, with consideration, what do my shin and calf need right now? My heel, ankle, foot and toes, how can I be of service to you right now? Just checking. And putting all of these different body parts together, the feet, the legs, the arms, the torso, the neck and the head. Sometimes I like to imagine the, the Pieta, it's a beautiful statue in Italy of the, the mother of Christ holding the Jesus in her hands, in her, the body, the dead body of Christ, but just holding the body in mind. I like to think of something beautiful that I would be caring towards my own body, that I would be very caring of this body and mind of mine and ask, what do I need right now? 
How can I take care of you? What do you need? And just as I wish to be at ease and that I wish to have kind consideration towards myself, so too do I wish that everybody in this room have kind consideration towards themselves and that I have a kindness towards everyone in this room. So what is the need of everybody in this room? Just checking. what's happening for, for us in this present time and space and what would be wholesome and beneficial. Just checking, just listening in. And just breathing into this space of Melbourne all around us to this morning. What do we need here in Melbourne right now? Just checking. What would be kind? What would be wholesome? What would be considerate right now? And across the whole of Australia this morning, this beautiful red continent, this red island. What do us Australians need today? What would be kind? What would be wholesome? What would be self-care? What would be an amends to ourselves in this time? Just checking. What would be nutritious? What would be food for the heart? Just checking. And for all of our surrounding neighbors and friends, Australia, uh, New Zealand and Indonesia, all around us here this morning, just checking, just listening in, just being sensitive and aware to our needs, to the needs of our neighbors, radiating it out wider and wider, this consciousness of this interbeing inter our, this interrelationship that we do not exist alone as a bubble, but we're interconnected with this whole universe around us. And just moving through Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Vietnam, Burma, this whole region, just checking, just listening, just wishing for the well-being and happiness of all of our neighbors in Southeast Asia this, this morning. And maybe just following the sun to the west, we come to South Asia, to India, to Sri Lanka, to Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, this whole region. Just checking in, just listening to the needs of this area of the world. Just inquiring, listening, giving kind regard and attention to this whole region this morning. And across the whole Middle East, from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Lebanon, Yemen, this whole region. Just checking what would be kind. How can I open the door of my heart to this whole region? And be a witness to the sufferings and the joys and the small victories of everyday life. moving through Africa, Egypt to Morocco, to South Africa, the whole region of Africa, all beings in Africa, just checking in. Good morning to all beings in Africa. 
Just checking in, what do you need right now? <coughs> what would be kind? What would be nutritious? What would be wholesome? And through Europe, from the boot of Italy to Scandinavia, from Portugal to Turkey, from Russia to Ireland, just checking in this morning, what would be healthy, what would be wholesome, what needs. And just across now the Atlantic to the Americas, North America, Central America, South America, the whole continent, all Americans, just checking. What's happening right now? And finally crossing the Pacific to the Far East, to Japan and Korea, China, Mongolia, Tibet, this whole region, just checking what's happening right now. What needs? And stepping back from this whole planet, maybe just viewing it like a globe, a ball, the great blue oceans, the great land masses, the polar caps, the clouds, the rivers, the lakes, the mountains, this beautiful planet Earth that is our home, just checking just checking what needs. Just checking in. Being with this planet Earth. And maybe I can just go and rest now where the sun is in the middle of the solar system, like a golden couch, or like a floaty on a swimming pool, just resting in this place in the middle of the solar system. And just listening to the whole universe all around, north, south, east, west, above and below, in all directions, just listening and breathing in and breathing out, this connection between myself, between this self and the universe. Breathing in and breathing out, this connection of deep listening and of connection. An inquiry, deep inquiry into the nature of all beings, self and other, other and self. Just listening with this intelligence and inquiry into what is the nature, what, what are the needs right now. And if there's nothing to do, then I just need to do nothing. It's okay. Just checking. Just bringing this quality of mindfulness to each breath, breathing in and out. This quality of investigation, Dhamma Vijaya, to each breath coming in and out. And bringing a sufficient or adequate amount of energy, just the right amount to stay with each breath coming in and out. This Vijaya energy, effort.
bringing these three factors of mind to the object that is arising in this present moment, whatever object that might be, sensations in the body, likes or dislikes, Vedana, Chitta, mind, thoughts, emotions, mental states, Dhamma, phenomena arising, sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, impinging upon any of the six sense doors. Just listening, showing up, being aware, investigating, with that adequate amount of energy to be present, neither too little nor too much, just reaching the object, being with the object. This is the right effort. The right amount of investigation, just enough to know the object. Not too much, not too little. And the right amount of mindfulness, so that I keep the object in mind so that I'm a witness to this present moment experience. I'm showing up and being present in my own life. So let me just inquire and check into the state of my heart, of my mind. How do I feel right now? Do I feel any joy? Do I feel calm and peaceful? Am I at ease or disease? Do I feel balanced and centered or disturbed and agitated? Do I feel I'm going from dark to brighter or brighter to more bright? Or am I going from bright to dark, 
or dark to darker? What is the direction? What is the flow? What is the current of my heart at this present moment? Do I feel constricted or expansive? Am I light or heavy? What is the current state of my heart? What is the tone? What is the ambience? What is the condition of this space in my heart? And how have things changed since I came here this morning? Do I appreciate, do I like the flavor of this experience? Do I value this experience that I'm experiencing right now or would I prefer something else? Just checking. I find it very important to know the condition of my own body and mind, to know the condition of my own heart. Checking in is very important. This healthy sense of self-awareness, knowledge of, our, of my own personal needs, knowing my necessities, knowing what requisites that I require. So as a monk I have four physical requisites, food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. And if you think about it, these are quite universal needs. These are necessities of life. So even as a monastic we Though we try to live a very simple life, we still have necessities. You, you pare it all back. Maybe you strip away all of the uh, scaffolding and supports to some degree that are uh, unnecessary. But we strip them back to what is necessary. And these are essential, the essentials of life. So these are physical necessities. We also need things like peace. We, it's much better to be in peace than in war. So there are, we need physical security. So there are all kinds of necessities that are physical in nature, you can say. But there are also Vedana, likes and dislikes. So it can be quite personal what I like and what I dislike. It's a lot due to my nature. You can say my genetics that will predispose me to liking certain things and disliking other things. That I feel comfortable or I like something or I don't like something. So for instance, I can be very prone to anxiety or I can be a very kind of calm temperament person. <coughs> And then also I have my nurture, I have my conditioning that comes from my childhood, from my childhood carers, and just through the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. As I pass through life, I get conditioned by life. I get conditioned by my society and the people I surround myself with. So this will flavor what I like and I dislike. 
maybe I like a certain political party or I dislike a certain political party or I like a certain kind of music or I dislike a certain kind of music. You know, and acquire, I, I acquire a taste. So this can be very personal, this taste that I have that flavors what I like and what I dislike, what I feel comfortable with, what I don't feel comfortable with. So typically what I'm familiar with, I'm comfortable with. What I'm not familiar with, I'm not comfortable with. It's a kind of general rule of thumb. And then we have mind states, mind states that are conditioning what is my experience of life. So if I have a habit of being angry, well, maybe I'm a bit difficult to be around for others. I'm impactful on others. It depends on how I express my anger. For instance, if I'm a very active, angry kind of person, then it's quite difficult for me to be in company of others. But I can also be very passive aggressive. I can find indirect ways of getting back somebody. Or I can be very covered in my anger, hiding it, pretending that I'm not angry when in fact I'm seething underneath. So my mental states are very important in conditioning how I experience the world. And I can be quite unaware of these things because of habit. I can be quite blindsided to my own nature because of habits. It's normal, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. So I can have habits around certain emotions. If I don't bring this intelligence and inquiry and investigation and make some effort towards self-awareness and self-knowledge, I will not know my nature. I'll just be ricocheting from one encounter to the next. And I will not be cultivating an intelligence and an understanding and a wisdom about my own nature and the nature of the world around me. So I find it very, very helpful to understand what are my boundaries. What are my boundaries? So boundaries are physical. If we look at physical boundaries, it's like the dis space between you and me. So as a monk, it can be quite uncomfortable if somebody wants to come up and hug me, especially if it's a woman or something like that. It can be quite challenging because as monastics, we need to keep a physical space especially from the opposite gender. So we can have lots of sort of monastic rules, like we don't handle money. This is an unusual physical boundary that I have, a boundary condition, that I don't handle money, I don't come in touch with it. So sometimes people offer me money and I have to say politely, I don't, I don't touch money, I don't receive money. Maybe you can, so I need to find a skillful way and means to in some ways avoid these situations and in other times uh, to process this situation when it arises. So these are physical boundaries, for instance. Other physical boundaries would be that I don't harm others. So we just recited the precepts at the start. Pana, tipata, ramani, sikapadang, samadhi, ami. I try to avoid harming others, especially killing them. Another physical boundary is that I try to adina dana where ramani sikapadang samadhi ami. I try to not take what I have no permission for. This is the basic meaning of adina dana, to not take without permission. But basically, you know, it's pointing towards theft, theft of physical property. So this is a physical boundary that I try to keep. Kame sumi cha cha ra we ramani sikapadang samadhi ami. I try to observe what I call good sexual boundaries with others. Physical boundaries, like the space between myself and others, but also especially sexual boundaries. Musa wada we ramani sikapadang samadhi ami. I try to observe good verbal boundaries with others. So this means especially try to avoid lying. I try to avoid lying, which is like I deliberately try to deceive somebody. You know, so there's a difference between a joke or an actor 
who is pretending to be a character uh, as opposed to somebody who's deliberately, deliberately deceiving somebody. Okay, so there's a difference between lying and pretending. So I try to avoid lying. I try to avoid harsh speech, divisive speech, and just trash talking. Then sura me raya macha pamadatana. I try to avoid things that are delusional to the mind, that delude the mind and weaken it. Intoxicants and so forth, which delude the mind. These are another boundaries, physical, uh, physical boundaries that I observe in my life. So these are things that you can say are, I try to keep outside of the walls of my life. If it was a castle, these are things that are outside of the walls of the castle. But there's also inside the walls of the castle, things that I try to keep within, inside my boundaries. So these are things like, I try to practice harmlessness. I try to practice harmlessness. So this is the first boundary, the other way around. And the second boundary, the other way around, is I try to practice generosity rather than theft. If I have surplus, if I have abundance, if I have wealth, more than I need, more than is necessary, more than is essential, then it is abundance. So if I, if I tenaciously try to hang on to what I have loads of, it's the scarcity of mind that is driving that process. So I try to practice abundance, abundant thinking that there is enough, there will be enough, this is okay. So I try to practice abundance and generosity, enoughness, enoughness. I try to check in, what are my needs? Is this okay with me? Have I enough? Is this more than enough? Okay, can I share this? I try to practice physical boundaries, meaning that I try to keep healthy sexual boundaries with others, especially sexual boundaries, but other boundaries, physical boundaries of various kinds. So I'm conscious, aware, so that I'm not clunky and unskillful. I'm not thundering around, you know, not being, um, you know, taking up more space than I need to physically, shall we say. Being awkward. There's a skillfulness in how we move through the crowd when I was a child, my father would send me out to look at, we had cattle, we had cows, and he would say, look at, go and look at the cattle, count them and see if they're okay. And cows are a herd animal. So what you do is you normally, you try to get the animals to move around. And if they're healthy, they will move together as a group. There's a very uh, synchronized movement that a herd of animals has. You know, they move in a very coordinated way together, but if they're sick, they, they don't. They're not able to uh, synchronize with the rest of the herd. So if you see an animal that isn't walking or moving in sync with the rest of the herd, you know it's probably sick or ill or something is up with it. And you need to investigate more carefully. So physical boundaries are very important. You tend to find crazy people are not able to synchronize with the rest of the crowd. You know, like they're barreling through a crowd like there were skittles going through, you know, a bowling ball going through skittles. And verbal boundaries are very difficult, very, very difficult. The commentaries talk about a situation where they, um, the Bodhisattva, the, the Buddha-to-be, for many, many lifetimes, he would keep all of the precepts, the five precepts. He would, sorry, in, in his long life, many, many lives before he was enlightened, there was, he broke four of the five precepts. So the, the commentaries discuss that the one precept that the Bodhisattva never broke was this speech. So speech is indeed the most, one of the most difficult because in many ways it's closest to our thinking and our, to our mind. You know, it's closest to our thinking and to our mind and truth. And anybody who's a truth seeker is uh, going to be very careful about what they think and what they say. Sometimes our actions are you know, but this is the hardest one, is speech. And having good, skillful boundaries verbally with others is very, very difficult. You know, because what, you know, can, can be funny to one group of people, can be very insulting to another group of people, or 
what sounds pleasant to one group of people can be very unpleasant to another group of people and it can be very very difficult we can really um, intend to for instance not be insulting but what comes out is sounds insulting there's an example given of where one of the arahants at the time of the buddha was was um he was from a very high class brahmin family he was very haughty how he spoke he sounded very contemptuous and condescending towards the other monks and he used to really rub them up you know he was he sounded really arrogant and you know haughty and lofty and above people and putting everybody down and he it was really annoying to, it was very difficult to be around so they they complained about his speech to the to the buddha and the buddha said no 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 please be patient please forgive him it's just his manner of speaking he has been he has been born into this high caste status for many many lives 500 lives he was so deeply conditioned by his nature and his nurture that he didn't have this malice or intent you know he was just unskillful in how he spoke you know relative to others if you know Asian languages, this this kind of ways of being very gradated. There's, there's not just I and you. There's this there's an I that's above you, and all these kind of things. It makes it quite painful if somebody is permanently haughty with you or speaking in the royal with you, you know, and you're some sort of servant to them. You know, it feels it feels very demeaning. But apparently he was fully enlightened, and he, he really had no malice. It was just his way, his manner. And finally, delusional stuff. Well, I try to keep a clarity of mind. So I, I don't take intoxicants and other things like that. I, I appreciate greatly the uh, clarity of mind. So I, I'll give you an example. I was at home with my family, and my family still enjoy drinking. And it's not like they're particularly drinking when I'm around, but they might have a glass of wine at uh, supper or something like this. And so I'm not eating supper, and I'm also not drinking, and, but they'll have a glass of wine. So I used to watch very carefully uh, how, firstly, the size of the glass of wine is quite tremendous these days. You can get almost a half a bottle of wine into a glass of wine. Quite, a, quite amazing. There's nothing glass about a glass of wine anymore, I think. It's more like tumbler or something. And uh, they're just, they used to tell me, just chilling out. And wine these days, when I was a kid, you'd have to go to the liquor store to get wine. But these days, you just get it at Tesco's on your shopping. So it's part of the shopping budget. It's not actually part of your, uh, shall we say, luxury budget anymore. It's, it's in the essentials. It's very sneaky how they're doing that. And they're just chilling out at home watching some television before they go to bed. They're putting down half a bottle of wine a day. But I was interested to know and how quickly they were switching off. You know, I've traveled from the other side of the planet and I'm, I don't have a lot of time with them. And I'm making my time for them. And I'm trying to understand how long does it take before they switch off. So how long, how much wine do you need to take before you switch off from the conversation and you're no longer present? What, what do you think? Hmm? One mouthful? Two mouthfuls? I've come from the other side of the planet and I'm trying to connect. How quickly do they disconnect? Two glasses? That, that would be a bottle. <laughs> My observation was, in the effort of reaching out to the glass of wine, they were switched off. It would just, just reaching out, I don't know if you see my head, it was like reaching out. They were switched off before they even touched the glass. It was like they had given themselves permission to check out. Checking out from their situation, from the world. Checking out from a meaningful relationship with another. Just checking out. It was gone. It was, it was game over, conversation finished. No more 
you know, back and forth. You know, it was just, that's it, end of the story, end of the evening. So this is very delusional, I think, you know, not to show up, not to be present, not to be involved, and to sort of obliterate and be numb to our own suffering and existence. So these are ways that I use things like the five precepts to have healthy boundaries between myself and the world, to know my own reality, because ultimately knowing my own boundaries is knowing what I need, what are my necessities. And there are many, many other kinds of boundaries that we can have. We can have spiritual boundaries, emotional boundaries. So one of the things that I noticed around emotional boundaries is, is sometimes when I feel a little angry with, I'm in the company of somebody else and I'm feeling a bit angry. I check in, why do I feel angry? And I've discovered really that a lot of emotions are very contagious. So sometimes it's, I might be hungry for instance. I can be, you know, in a physical need, a physical necessity. And I feel angry because I feel hurt, I feel painful, I feel a lot of stomach pain happening. So again, in, in the commentaries to the Vinaya that we have, it always suggests that if you want to get something from the abbot of the monastery, that the right time is after the meal, not before the meal. So I've practiced this quite a bit with Ajahn Brahm, you know. You know, he's all very cheery, but I assure you, you you'll, you're better off to wait till after the meal. <laughs> you'll probably get things going your way a lot easier. There was a good study of court judges that you're more likely to get uh, the decision, a favorable decision after lunch than before lunch. There's a strong correlation between the feeding times of judges and the uh, outcome of the judgment. This is based on looking at thousands of judgments and just the time the judgment was given. So it's quite a neutral analysis of the situation. But I've also found that emotions can be quite contagious and if I don't have physical boundaries or mental boundaries or emotional boundaries with others, then their anger, the anger of the other person. So sometimes when I pick up by feeling angry, I have to check and go, oh, hang on a second, maybe the other person's angry, I better be careful here. And they're being covered with their anger. I spent a long time living and working in Asia, so this mode of covering over anger is very, very common in Asia. I mean, Australians might be a bit in your face at times when they don't like something, but they're actually quite straightforward and you know that you've angered them, you've hurt them, you've crossed a line. A lot of Asians can be very difficult to read because they're so skillful at covering over how they actually feel. So we need to be careful and check in. Why do I feel anxious around this person? Why do I feel angry around this person? Why do I feel uncomfortable around this person? Why am I walking on eggshells around this person? So these are boundaries that are being crossed. That for some reason this person is crossing my boundaries. This person is cutting me off. This person always has the last word. This person always has to have the last word. This person always speaks down to me and to others. Is it personal or impersonal? Is this something to do with me or is this just generally this person's habit? So even an arahant can be very annoying. You know, and if that person is annoying me, I need to check in and take care of myself. That's my business. Am I taking care of myself around this person or not? Am I meeting my needs? So another characteristic of people who are manipulative is, is that they're able deftly to apply fear, obligation, guilt, and shaming. So when I feel fear, when I feel obligation, when I feel guilt, when I feel shaming, maybe the person is blackmailing me and I will look for double standards. Is, are they expecting me to only give and that they take? So that's a boundary because friendship is basically around giving and taking. And if, it's, if I'm with a taker, I'm going to be bled to death. I'm not protecting myself. Adina dana, we ramani, sikapadang samadhi ami. I will practice generosity, but that doesn't mean I will practice being a sucker and a doormat to people. I will not be with harmful people. I will protect myself in some way. I need to be protective of myself, take care of myself. These are our boundaries to be observed. So these boundaries are physical, verbal, emotional, spiritual, sexual, financial. They're 
more mental than physical, but it's easier to talk about the physical. So when we're teaching the children, like I had the experience for the last year, I've been teaching the teen group here, we've been working our way through boundaries, physical boundaries. So in this room I had 22 teenagers walking into each other, trying to find what was that space. So it was very interesting at the start. They would just stay in groups of friends and they would walk towards each other and some they would just walk up and hug each other. This is called having no boundary with the other person. No physical boundary, they would just walk up and hug the other person. Okay, that's a nice way to start. But then you, you mix them around. The girls walk into the boys and they've never met the boy before. I assure you they don't walk up and hug the guy. You know, whether the person is taller or smaller, whether the person is the same race or not, it all makes a difference. The space is extremely dynamic. So we were teaching them to watch the physical cues that are happening, where somebody is saying no, or they're freezing, or they're backing off from you, that's a no. We had another class here on speech, how to have right speech. So one of the biggest, most difficult lessons is how to say no to somebody. <clears throat> the children need to know how to say no. It's not that as Buddhists we have to say yes and be agreeable to everybody, we need to politely be able to say no. So one of the nice examples I had was, you pig, you ate all my chips. How do you say this in a skillful way? So some of the kids were very, very good Buddhist school students. They said, it's okay. This is called having no boundaries. This is called being a doormat. This is called being a victim to a bully or, you know, putting yourself in harm's way because we're not able to say no. Putting in a verbal boundary with somebody who is being abusive is not okay. It's not okay for the bully and it's also not okay for the person being bullied. They need to inform the person in a polite way. So it's unskillful to say you pig, you had all my chips because this is insulting. You're using the accusatory you, okay? So it's very interesting. I've done this many times with many different groups and I had a six-year-old recently. I was asking their parents, did they know the answer to this? How would they frame this in a skillful way? And of course the parents had no idea. And uh, then I said, because it's conditioned. They, they hadn't learned it or else they had had their boundaries so written over so many times. Especially as Asians, we can just go around and suck it up. This isn't okay at times to suck it up. So we got one of their six-year-old children in. Somebody who hadn't been conditioned into sucking it up just yet. And she said, I feel angry when somebody takes my chips. It's not okay. Okay, same message, same message. Very different effect, it's being firm, it's giving somebody the hard word without being rude or ignorant and impolite. So speech is very difficult to have good verbal boundaries around. And it also requires that we check in, how do I feel? I mean, if you've just had 25 bags of crisps, maybe the person taking one more bag of crisps of yours is okay. But, you know, if you were, just working all day and you came home at eight o'clock at night and your flatmates have tucked into all of your grub and there's nothing left and the shops are closed and you're starving, it ain't cool that they not get the message. That doesn't mean you go on a rampage and smash the room. It's like how do you put very firm and clearly to them that this has been very hurtful and it's not okay. Okay? So boundaries are very, very important, but they require us to know our needs. To know what our needs are, and it requires us to say no in life sometimes, and that's very, very difficult, and we need to practice. We need to practice saying no in front of the mirror, by ourselves, long before we ever need to deploy it, and we need to be able to do it in a kind, skillful way. So I appreciate when I find good and skillful ways and means, or I really appreciate when I find people who are naturally very good at this. They've learned somehow in their life how to say no to people in a kind way, polite way, firm, polite, clear way. I'll give you one final example. I went and asked a monk, a senior monk who 
was very, very pivotal in my life. In fact, I was talking last night about faith and confidence, and he was the person who really cracked this one for me. So another time, I went to ask him, and I said to him, uh, what is Sama Vayama? No, sorry, what is Sama Virya? Today we mentioned Virya means effort. So he didn't, I asked this through a translator, he was Burmese. He didn't give any reply, just completely ignored the question. And then I asked, uh, what was Sama Sada? What is Sama Sada? Sada means faith and confidence. What's the right faith and confidence? Sama Sada. Again, he ignored the question. And then I said, what is Sama Sati? Sama Sati is right mindfulness, like we've been practicing mindfulness today. So he finally says, in all of the Pitaka, in all of our Buddhist teachings, there's only Sama, there is Sama Sati, but you cannot find Sama Samadhi or Sama Virya. We have Sada and we have Sama Vayama, but we do not have Sama Virya. He was a very particular Pali scholar. He wasn't going to acknowledge my question because it was not the right question. Very polite, very firm. He just kept silent. But it was a silence of like putting me in my place a little bit, not putting me down, but making it very firm and clear that I be a little bit more precise in what I'm saying and that I uh, be respectful in the questions that I'm putting to him. Or he, he was, he was. He knew he could say that to me. I, I, had, I had so much respect for him that, that um, he could be firm with me. Maybe with somebody else he would have just passed it over and answered the question and they would have moved on. But he was making a very firm point with me. And I have found this with a lot of my teachers. They're very, very skillful at saying no. You know, they get a lot of requests. They get a lot of requests. But they're also very firm at saying no. And you often find that with, say, very famous people and stuff like that. They, they actually have to say no a lot to people. Maybe they turn down 99% of their invitations because they are so busy. Even, even for them to achieve 1% of their invitations, that requires a lot of skill and effort. And they actually have to turn down 99% of their invitations. So they have to learn the art of saying no. And it's very, very important, these boundaries in life. And I find it that these boundaries require me to really check in with what are my needs and what are my necessities and what are my values, what are my principles, and be in touch with those and be guided by those in my life. And that's very important. Who, who I have no boundaries with, who I have medium-grade boundaries, and whom I have walls with. Very important, very, very important, and it's very dynamic, and it's very active. I'll give you one final example, is, is that when I was growing up in Ireland, I had a lot, you know, very close friends, school friends, college mates, batch mates, you know, and I found that um, when I returned to Ireland, I'd been away for 20 years, they had, um, you know, moved on and changed their lives and stuff like that. And I found I would reach out and I had always kept in touch with uh, people because as a migrant living overseas, um, I always felt it was my duty to keep in touch with the people I had left behind at home, at so-called at home, right? And, um, but the thing is that they didn't feel the same obligation to me or they hadn't the same principle or idea. You know, so they just moved on with their lives and they had lots of other, you know, friends, new friends, new colleagues, new relationships. Just as I had overseas, but when I would visit them at home, you know, we would put aside some time, meet up. But when I moved back to Ireland recently, I was there for a year, I would go and visit people and I would find, okay, they were very happy to see me and nice to catch up and all the rest, but mostly they were not interested in reciprocating, you know. They were just weren't in the habit, it wasn't important, they were very busy with their own lives. Whatever it was, it wasn't important, they didn't give it value, they didn't prioritize it. So I had to learn, accept that, that my friends were no longer friendly towards me. They were not really will, willing to make an effort. 
you know, for their own reasons. I'm not saying it was a bad reason or anything like that, but it would have been foolish for me to expect that would be a false expectation that they reciprocate or that they they have a, have the close relationship like we once had in the past or that they would make some time in their schedule for me on a regular basis, for instance. So this uh, watching boundaries, watching this interface between self and other is very, very informative and we can use mindfulness to pay attention to these boundaries that exist between ourselves and others and have areas of our lives that we know where we are easily wounded or hurted or offended by as trigger points, as like little alarm bells. So saying, take care of this, pay attention to this. What are my needs in this area? And I need to check in and take care of that. I need to check, take care of the changing situation that I'm in. For instance, when I had a surgery last year, I, needed, I couldn't have the same assumptions or presumptions about what my body was capable of. I had to explore carefully what I could do and couldn't do. You know, I couldn't hop in and out of cars or something like that. So this ability to perceive the world in some ways using this framework of boundaries is very important and very necessary in the spiritual life as well as in the daily life, in our interactions with everybody around us. And seeing that, for instance, relationships shift and change and I may feel hurt and lost because my friends don't call me and I need to take care of that. That's my, within my boundary, within my space. Because it's in this heart, in this interchange between self and others, is very important in our life. This is a huge part of our life. So even as a monastic, it's not okay for me to cut myself off from the world. If, if, I, had to cut my, if I could cut myself off from the world, I, why would I have these rules, like that I have to receive food in a bowl put there by a person? It forces me into an interaction with the world. So even in the spiritual life, I find without feedback, without engagement with community, with the world, you know, I can have these weird little defilements that are just kept, you know, stashed away and hidden. So it's in my interactions through my, with these boundaries with the world that I learn so much about myself. And I, oh, hang on, that's an area of the world, of my spiritual work I really need to work on, you know. So my effort to teach things like verbal boundaries and physical boundaries to, to the teen group was just a reflection of me studying and learning about these things myself. I had, you know, 22 guinea pigs, you can say, in the room for me to, like, explore and learn with and have them share their experience with me of what they were discovering as well. And in that way I learn all the time. But this really is very, very difficult. There's a science to it and an art. So I just thought today would be a nice day to, you know, introduce you maybe to some of these ideas and show you that they also, you can find things in the teachings of the Buddha that ex explore these boundaries. And um, I thought it would be a nice topic today. It's something I find very important in my own life. Thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.